Yeah, good. Now back up and start at the G and play it kind of slowly up to the F sharp and back down. Okay, now continue, start on that G again and go down to your low B and back up to your G. Yep, now back up. Yeah, do, do just that much. So G down to B and back to G. Great, okay, so that was G major, full range. We want to do that with every scale that we ever play because if you don't, then you rarely use those palm keys up top and you rarely play those low notes down at the bottom and you never really get complete control over them. So scales is the time to do that. And I'm really glad that you didn't know that F sharp fingering because the whole one of the main points of this is to go and and find where the problems are and then zero in and fix them and work on them. So we don't wanna just spend our whole time playing the whole scale and have the same problems keep coming up. We wanna identify the problem, take a pause, go in and fix it. It's kinda of like if you're, you've got a piece of wood and you wanna make it all smooth and most of it is smooth, but there's a rough spot. You don't get your sandpaper and sand the whole board. You just go, to where the rough spot is, smooth that out, and then test it again. And when then it's all smooth, then you're ready to go on to something else. All right, so for this scale, Melanie, let, I want you to do again those top three notes a few more times, because that's that F sharp was brand new to you. You picked it up quickly, but let's let it give you, let you give yourself a chance. So do it like as quarter notes and then eighth notes, kind of back and forth, like slow, fast, slow, fast. and go up and come back down. So do kind of a, a three note loop. Yeah, that's good. So now one thing on those, and I didn't hear this with you, Melanie, but for everybody else, saxophones in general, when you're using those palm keys, it's real common to get little grace notes that shouldn't be there. Like, like if, if you don't put them both down at exactly the right time together, you'll get a little grace note that you don't want. So anytime you hear that, you just go really slowly on those notes, slurring between them, so you can hear if your fingers are moving exactly together or not. And then when you speed up, you, you should hopefully be able to keep that. But if you don't, no big deal, just go back and do it slow again. If you keep doing it fast, it's the same problem is gonna stay there. It's not gonna just go away. You have to slow it down and then you can fix it pretty quickly. Um, all right, Melanie, let's do, do the whole scale. Now start on that G all the way up to F sharp, all the way back to G and then keep going down to low B and then come back up and end where you started. Yeah, so one more time and start, do everything as eighth notes and try doing the whole thing a little bit slower just this time. great that that was really good so that's that's the kind of thing now now if you try to do it faster i think you'd probably be a little more successful at it so the, the way to develop speed is by playing slow it's kind of the opposite of what you'd think most people think if i want to play fast i need to play fast but that's just not true if you want to play fast you have to play slow accurately and then you can 
usually play fast just as accurately. It sort of slows things down in your mind. So then when you're playing fast, it kind of feels like you're still playing slow, only you're going really fast. It stays really clean. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. All right, thank you, Melanie, for demonstrating that for us. That was really great. Um, so on the note, the idea of speeding up scales, uh, doing it like half or quarter speed and then full speed and going back and forth is a really good way to, to speed things up. Um, another way that I've been doing recently that I think is, is really kind of cool and fun is to use different rhythmic subdivisions and play your scales using those. So for instance, I'll take like a G major scale and do the whole thing in triplets. And then I'll do the whole thing in 16th notes and then do the whole thing in quintuplets and then sextuplets, septuplets and end with 32nd notes. So it starts out relatively slow. The triplets should feel pretty slow because otherwise you won't be able to keep up when it's time to do the 30 seconds and you're going to get incrementally faster each time through. And the, the reason I think this is really great is because it forces you to group the notes in different, different numbers. So sometimes you're grouping in threes, sometimes fours, sometimes fives, and the accents are slightly different, which means that your, your fingers are playing them a little tiny bit differently, which in the end makes your technique really smooth out and you really have good control over how you play. So let me demonstrate a full range scale using those different rhythmic values. And then I'm gonna ask a student to, to work through this. And I'll, I'll kind of show you how you can incrementally work up to playing a full range scale using any rhythmic value that you want. So to start with, I'm gonna slow that down because I can't play 30 second notes cleanly at that speed. We'll go down to that tempo. All right, so starting with triplets. <laughs> a little bit faster, not a lot faster. The goal is to, to play it as evenly as you possibly can. And sometimes, like on the septuplets, that's, that's a tricky one for me. And I sometimes will have to do them in like seven notes at a time so I know which note I'm going to line up with on the metronome because it, it changes in each octave. But um, let's have a student. You can pick the scale, and I'll show you how you can, can work through different rhythmic values. Um, if you have a metronome, that would be especially helpful too. So how about a student with a metronome handy? And you have a metronome on your phone? You're killing me. All right, who's, who's going to step up? All right, well, here's what we'll do. I'm going to make you listen to me play it on clarinet, and I'll show you this process, because I this is something that I, I think I need to work on a little bit on the clarinet. So if you get tired of hearing me play the clarinet, then just unmute yourself and turn your metronome on. We can listen to one of you guys do it. But so yeah, as you're as you're starting this out, you can pick a note that's kind of in the middle 
of your range. So you have about an octave above and an octave below. So C is a good choice or B or B flat. Those are all ones that give you room up and down or, or D really up anywhere between B flat and F is going to be okay. I'm going to do C though. So, I'm COVID. so you start out with eighth notes and you're just going to go up to down to. Okay, and then next step, you go down, down two eighth notes and back up. Okay, that sounded all right. Now put them together. All right, let's add a note. We'll go up three notes and it'll sound like triplets. Then go down three. Put them both together. Okay, that's pretty solid. Move on to the next one. So this will be four notes up, so 16th notes, starting on C, going up to G. And go down. Put them together. Okay, now it's where it starts to get a little interesting. It's going to be five notes. So, but we're just going to add one note up and fit those five notes into the same amount of time. And then go down. And then put them together. And then we go another note. So six notes up. That sounds good, then put them together. And you can loop that and just keep it going a few times if you want to clean something up. All right, okay, so that was six tuplets. Do seven. Seven is going to take you up the full octave. And that, that's probably sufficient then for that. And you, you get that. And then, that, so that was with one key. You might do another key and work on that that same way. So we're starting with very small numbers of notes and just slowly expanding on that. And by the time you do that, an octave up and an octave down, then, then you're probably ready to just keep going and do it the full range of your instrument. And then when you start doing full range scales like that, you the turnaround points are going to be different on each key. So it lines up a little differently. You have to kind of work that out. But but you you can do that, you know, just try to have it line up with the metronome when you want it to. And then then that's that's good. So then the, the final thing that I want to get you guys thinking about with scales, it, so far we've been sticking with one one key at a time, but we want to get to where we can switch to any key anytime without having to think a bunch about it. We don't want to think about how many sharps are in the key of E and which ones are they. We want to just know as easy as right and left or two plus two is four, like just basic stuff. So that if you're, somebody says, we're going to play this tune in this key, or if you get a piece of music and you see a key signature, you know, you just know what that is immediately. It's just information. It's not, not something that you have to puzzle through just, um, so the way that, that I like to do that is to, um, I'll demonstrate with a, a full range exercise. So you start on saxophone, it works good to start on an A, play it all the way up an A scale, all the way down to the bottom, come back up when you get to the G sharp, instead of thinking of G sharp, think of it as an A flat and then switch to the key of A flat, play it all the way up, all the way down when you get to the G, you switch and you think of it as a G major scale. So, um, and on this one, you just pick one rhythmic value to do it. You could do 16th, triplets, quintuplets, sextuplets, whatever uh. to do. Um, and I'll, 
I'll just demonstrate this one for you as um, I like doing this as quintuplets because it lines up pretty well almost every time. Um, and with this one, doing 12 scales in a row, full range, you're going to have to breathe. So just when you need a breath, take a breath, come back in where you left off one beat later. Okay, so here, here's changing keys, all 12 keys, full range. <laughs> three minutes or so not very much time um, and that's a great thing to kind of work up to the way to work up to that though is not to just jump in and decide one day you're going to do that all 12 keys full range one day because you'll probably spend all day and wear yourself out and never want to do it again so you have to break it down into smaller bites that are more manageable so the way the, the smaller bite method of that i like to do is to take one scale like C major scale and just do it up to the fifth and back down. So, and then we're going to pair that with one other key. So, that was C major. Let's add B major to that. So, this time we're going to go up C to G, back down. And when you would play C, instead of playing C, you jump and you play a D, I mean a B, and you play a B major scale up and down. So, it'll sound like this. And then you go back to the C and you just go back and forth between those two keys until they both feel pretty easy. All right. When you want to end it, just don't go to the other key. Once you can do that well, you could expand it to a full range of the scale. And, and do that with a full range or a full octave range. The next step you could do is maybe add a third key. You can cycle it between three. So. Just keep doing those three and just expand the number of keys you do it on. Or you could pick two different keys somewhere else, starting on two different keys all together. Um, and by doing that, you can kind of branch out and eventually get to where you can do all of them, no problem. And by the time you do that, you won't, it won't be any big deal what key you're playing. And you just need to know so you can, can switch to that key. It's a, this is a cool way to practice, I think, because you almost always end up with one scale that's really comfortable and easy to play next to one that's not as easy to play. So you kind of go back and forth and you get the, the harder one to play. It gets, it gets to improve and it gets more comfortable until you can't really tell the difference between them. And by having that comparison side by side, you can do that more quickly. Um, and again, initially you just start slow and then add your speed in as you go. And it's always, if you run into a, a problem with your fingering, you don't like how it sounds, just go back way slow 
and then speed it back up again. And if the problem's gone, you're all set. If it's not, go really slow again. I fall into this trap constantly myself. I'll practice things fast and I'll just keep doing it fast over and over. And I have to say, hold on, you're not taking your own advice right now. Slow it down. When I slow it down, it gets better almost every time the first time. So it's real stuff. Um, we're up to 12 o'clock now. And I, I would like to hear from you guys some, some questions, things you want to talk about. Because I've been talking a lot this last hour. Um, ask him and then come over to. So the first question is from Melanie. All right. Who's coming over to the mic? Speak loud. Here you go. Um, for the full range scale, for the full range scale, wait. Back a little bit. Okay. Go. For the full range scale, um, when you get like when you finish, like when you're gonna go to the next one, how do you like? transition to the next scale. Um, yeah, okay. So like that last one where I was going full range and then changing. Yeah, just when you, the way I was doing it, I, when I get to the leading tone, so like if you're playing a A major scale, when you get to the A, sh the G sharp, as soon as you hit that note, you just start thinking about that next scale starting on the note a half step down. So um, I usually skip the last the last note like so instead of resolving I just take off you know I think of the seventh as though it were the first note of the scale if that makes sense there's a lot of ways to talk about this with words it's kind of hard to know which what's going to work be most understandable but yeah um yes I I can it's probably easier if I, I'll just show again. So G major, we'll start down. So as soon as you hit that, the leading tone, you think of that as the new key, and then you proceed and just keep, keep going one to the next. And you can do that going up or down you can pick whatever note you want to change on just when you get to that one, change gears to the new key right there. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. Okay, who else has a question? Anybody here? I have a question. Yes. Um, I, what kind of tips other than the ones you talked about would you say to someone that wants to audition for the Marines, like band, since I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. Uh, yeah, um, yeah that, that's great. So, I mean, you got to, the, the auditions, like the Marine Band audition is, it's a classical audition. So that's the only thing they're listening for is, is the classical types of audition skills. So uh, what the audition looks like is when there's a vacancy, you'll get notification. They send it across the country when there's a, an audition coming up. And if you're interested, you call up and you request an audition packet and they'll send you, you know, a, a book of, excerpts from wind ensemble literature and there's your choice of maybe two or three different solos like the Creston Sonata or something like that and um, to, to play a movement of and then some sight reading and that's kind of the, the first round of the audition um, and yeah so to prepare for that honestly the the thing that stands out the most are, are sound fundamentals so like within a few notes you can hear if somebody's got a good sound that they're playing with, if they have a good sense of time, a good sense of intonation. And th those are just, you know, if all of those basic things are really consistently good. That's what's important because that, that way you, you can fit in with any other musicians who play with that same kind of sound concept and it's going to work out. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I would say like, just be really, consistent about working on the basics and be just really, really solid with those. And that's the biggest thing. Um, yeah, just touching on the audition day, what that actually looks like. So the first round of the audition happens behind a screen. So the people, the panel you're playing for doesn't see you and you don't see them. All they hear is the sounds out of your instrument. 
because they want it to be as completely impartial as possible just based on you know what you can do on your instrument that's the only thing that matters um, and so out of that preliminary round there can be as many as 100 or 120 people who show up for the audition they'll usually pick five to ten people to invite back for the finals then for the finals they take the screen down you end up playing more than in the prelims the prelims you maybe play four or five minutes in the finals it's probably more like 20 minutes and they'll kind of ask you to do things differently than you did the first time like change your articulation or maybe play with a different type of vibrato or things like that just to see if you're able to make those adjustments immediately without needing time to go back and practice a bunch and to see if you get all bent out of shape if somebody suggests that you should do something differently than you just did um, we have to be able to as as professionals you have to be able to take you know criticism and without getting offended by it um yeah, let's see and then yeah so also in the finals there's an aspect where you'll play with in the saxophone audition you'll play with three other people from the saxophone section as a quartet to kind of see how you can blend in and just fit in stylistically and make the adjustments that you need to make to do that um, which is a really important part of the job too because we there's eight of us in the section and we need to be able to any of us show up on a given day and play together and sound like the saxophone section of the marine band so that's they've included that in the audition as well so yeah i mean just steady work on your fundamentals and just keep improving every every aspect of of your playing is the key to having a successful audition for the marine band or any other band okay thank you yeah, good question Got it. Any other questions? You have a question? Go ahead. He's got a question. Uh, this is Elias Leader. All right. What kind of mouthpiece do you prefer to play on? Is what he's saying. What do you like? Uh, okay. Yeah. So. What do you recommend? On alto, I, I you know we play all the different saxophones, so I'll, I'll rattle off my list of mouthpieces. On alto, I like for classical playing. Uh, the Van Doren AL3, or I've recently been playing an AP3 some. And on alto for jazz, I, I like a hard rubber Jody jazz mouthpiece a lot. Before that, I always played an auto link. And I tried a lot of different jazz mouthpieces on alto, and I would always come back to my old hard rubber auto link. But this Jody jazz, I liked a little better, so I've switched to that one. On tenor, um, I've been using a Van Doren T20 or a Selmer um, soloist. And I, I like both of those. And for jazz on tenor, I like to use a brancher. Um, on Barry, I use a, for jazz, I use a Berg Larson. And for classical, I use a Selmer D. And yeah, on soprano, I use a Selmer C double star. And a, for jazz, a Barry mouthpiece. So, and yeah, actually for, the, for reeds, I'm anticipating what your next question might be. I've switched to, um, on most of my instruments, to these Legere plastic reeds. The whole section has started playing on these. I was kind of the last holdout to, to keep using cane, and I realized that I should probably switch and use similar material that everybody else is using. And um, I, I really hated it at first, but some of the guys told me, oh, you gotta, don't just change reeds. You need to find a, a mouthpiece that works with the reed better because some mouthpieces work better with plastic reeds than others. And so that kind of led me to experimenting a lot. And, and this whole coronavirus time was a perfect time to order a bunch of mouthpieces and have lots of time to mess around with different setups. So that, that's one of the things I've done in the last however many months it's been now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? For all the exercises we did, does it work uh, on any instrument? Yeah, good, great question. It does. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been sharing these scale exercises with 
different schools with all of the different instruments. But yeah, the, the long tones, those are that's great on any instrument. But all those tonguing exercises, they're great. Um, the scale things, when you're doing them full range, you have to just, you know, compensate for whatever the range is of the instrument. But yeah, it works. It works great on that. That's just, yeah, it, it's good for any instrument, for sure. All right. Any other questions, guys? Can you tell them what your typical day is, you know, uh, or a week, you know, as far as what you you have to do as a military musician? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, there's kind of a large spectrum of typical days and weeks. So depending on the season, our, our work is very much seasonal. Um, typically in the summertime, we do two outdoor concerts per week plus funerals at Arlington, a Friday night parade at the Marine Barracks and you know any number of White House jobs as those come up. So the way it usually breaks down is there will be four saxes on the concert that week and they'd have two rehearsals to go with the two concerts and then the other people who are not on the concert would be on the ceremonies for that week. And so whatever funerals come up or White House jobs come up, those people would would cover those jobs and then that that changes week to week so if you're on a concert one week then you'll probably be on ceremonies the next week and it rotates around and and we change which instruments we play regularly too um in the in the fall often we travel usually in october we're we're going city to city playing concerts in the 48 states so four of us from the section would be doing that the other four would be back here doing the White House jobs, funerals, other ceremonies that we're called on to do in Washington, D.C. Um, we also do, like, uh, we have a spring concert series, and those are indoor concerts, Sunday afternoons, and those would have, like, four rehearsals leading up to them during the week. And typically, with those have a little bit heavier music, they're longer concerts and maybe some more complicated music on them so that we have more rehearsals for. Um, you generally get your music three to four weeks before the concert so that you have a week or two to practice on your own before the first rehearsal. And in the first rehearsal, everybody comes with their parts solidly learned and we work on you know ensemble things during the rehearsals it's very rare for things to not sound pretty much performance ready on the first rehearsal. Sometimes we might have a brand new piece of music that came in kind of late that nobody's played before and the first rehearsal might sound a little rough, but it's, it's absolutely amazing to come back and hear the next rehearsal, how everybody has gone home and taken care of what needs to be taken care of with their part. And it's like, you know, the difference is night and day and it's, instantly way better so that practicing at home is definitely that's something that we do all the time as well no matter how busy we are um, some weeks you have a lot of time to do that and so those weeks you want to take advantage of going through and finding your reads that you're going to need for the weeks coming up um, you know other times you have less time to practice at home because you're you know riding on buses waiting to play at the white house or whatever it is that we're doing um, and you, you just don't have as many hours to spend practicing. And that's just kind of the way it breaks down. But um, yeah, I think, you know, one thing that's true of everybody in the Marine Band is we've all had like several years in our life where we did have four or five, six hours every single day that we spent practicing and just do that over and over and over again. And that's, that's really what it takes to get to a really high level of musicianship. And then once you in a group like this, you keep doing that as much as you can, but it's more more maintenance, um, and you you go into that intense practice mode as you need to. For instance, when we have chamber music concerts, and sometimes we have really challenging music that we program for those, um, and you'll spend lots and lots of time to prepare those pieces for, for that series. Um, and it's a lot of fun. We get to choose those pieces ourselves so that nobody's forcing us to do that. It's all voluntary. Um, but that, those are some of my favorite programs to put together. 
so yeah, that, that's where, kind did, of a, where did you go to school? Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I went to undergraduate at the University of North Texas and did a jazz studies degree there, but I also played classical a lot. Um, and then I took some time off after that, worked on cruise ships as a musician, um, and then toured some with the Glenn Miller Orchestra. And then I went to graduate school at New England Conservatory of Music and did a classical degree there, but still played a lot of jazz. So I've always done a lot of classical and a lot of jazz. And I've all, I struggle if somebody asks me, which is my favorite style to play. I, I love them both. Right. Well, last uh, Midwest, I got some uh, lanyards from the Marines. And right. I give two of the kids today lanyards for, for participating and, and being helpful. Nelson, I have one for you for at home. So whenever you see me, make sure you get it. And then the second one we're going to give to Melanie because she was brave enough to come play. So, but I just wanted to, again, thank you so much for your time today. You know, they, they don't realize what a treat it is to have someone of your caliber to come play for them and talk to them about uh, uh, the saxophone and music. It's very inspiring, truly. Yeah, we really appreciate we were able to do this. I, things like this to me are one of the, the bright spots of this whole Corona shut, shut everything down. Like we, or otherwise we wouldn't really be doing this kind of a thing at all unless we were traveling. And we, you know, we always try to go in person to schools when we are on the road, but it's been neat to get to do this on a lot bigger scale this month. So yeah, thank yeah. you guys all. And you, you better give a lanyard for uh, Leandro because he, he jumped in twice and did some, some playing in class. I have a I have a lander I can give him. So whenever you see me, Andrew, make sure you get it from me, okay? But uh, thank you again, and and uh, you know truly uh, we appreciate you serving. Right on, yeah, I appreciate it. Yep, look us up if you're ever in Washington D.C. Come check out the Marine Band. Okay. Everybody have a great rest of the day. Take care. Give it up for him, guys. Thank you again, okay? All right, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so those of you in the class, um, you know, hopefully you enjoyed it and you learned something from it. Um, like I said, you know, that group, the President's Own, let me tell you, it's extremely, extremely, extremely hard to get into. And to get someone to, get, to give a master class for you guys is awesome. You know, they, they, that was a really, really unique opportunity. As a matter of fact, I told some of my band director friends that they were working with you guys and they were so jealous. And the reason this happened, by the way, is because my wife happened to catch on Facebook that they were doing that, but you had to request it in a certain amount of time and all that stuff. She told me about it and that's why we have these clinics going on this week, this week and next week. So um, hopefully you enjoyed it, you know, and uh, you know, I appreciate you guys and everything you do, okay? So you guys can uh, Zoom can go ahead and bail out and uh, practice, practice, practice. Okay, listen to me. Next class, we're listening to half of your solo, so you need to make sure tomorrow you're ready to play and uh, and for Friday. Okay, tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday, we're gonna be listening to your solos. So make sure you have your solo down that you know you can play it well the first half of it at least. Any questions? And by the way, the, the, this job, the present zone, like I was telling you, this is like a symphony. A symphony job, you have to wait for a person to retire pretty much or die to get a spot in that, in that group. You know, so again, it's a very, very high caliber. So Nelson, you're asking about the military band. All of the military auditions are not like that. What he was explaining that's the ones for the premier bands. The premier bands, there's very few people they could take. So that's why they have different levels of it and all this stuff. Usually when you'll do a Marine audition for a band, it'll only have, you know, they'll have you play, they'll have to do scales. It won't be a screen involved. They'll just listen to you. And then they'll tell you if you qualify. And if you qualify, then they'll tell you what you qualify for. That's pretty much the way it goes. Um, also, my brother is the band director at Storm and Douglas, but he's also in charge of the 13th Army National Guard Band. So if you'd ever like to go to a rehearsal one day, 
I am more than willing to take you. You can even play along and with them in the rehearsal. So something to think about one day we'll do, okay? But uh, again, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it. Please, please, please thank your teachers because I let them know about this yesterday because they switched the, the day. It, yours wasn't supposed to be until next week. So they were nice enough to, to roll the punches and especially thank Dr. Barceta because Dr. Barceta was the one that proved it. So again, send him an email, tell him how much you enjoyed it. I would love you to copy me on the email so I know you did it. And thank you guys. Have a great day. Okay. Practice, practice, practice. Thank you. Thank you.